Today we're going to be in part five, which is actually the last part of this message series that we're calling Stand, as we've been looking at five different stories from the Old Testament book, the book of Daniel. If you have your Bibles or mobile device, whatever you use, we'll have the, uh, the verses on the screen as well. We're going to be in Daniel chapter three, so we're going backwards today. We'd been in Daniel chapter six and Daniel chapter 10. Uh, the previous two weeks, we're going to go back today to Daniel chapter 3. And this message today is entitled, Standing Firm in the Fire. This is um, probably a message, I mean, a, a section of, of the Old Testament that some of you are familiar with, just like Daniel in the lion's den. Here we're going to um, be looking at a very familiar section of, of Daniel in the Old Testament, especially if you're somebody that grew up in church and Sunday school and all that, you probably heard this story a lot. The reality today is that is right now, a lot of you, unfortunately, are probably going through a very difficult time. Um, we have, are in the midst of uh, uncharted territory the last six or seven months as we've encountered this worldwide pandemic. Um, so a lot of you, I know, are experiencing some difficult times. Maybe even before the pandemic came along, you were experiencing that. You know, I've heard it said this way, that you're either coming out of a hard time you're in the middle of a hard time, or you're going in to a hard time. And a lot of us, as Jesus followers, for some reason, we have this thought process that, that we shouldn't really ever suffer a whole lot because we're Jesus followers. But Jesus himself said this. John recorded it in John chapter 16, verse 33, where he said, in this world, you will have trouble. Um, so the words of Jesus, I think we should take those pretty literally, because he's the only man that ever predicted his, his own death and his own resurrection and pulled it off. So if he says that in this world we will have trouble, we need to go along with that and understand. But he says then, the second part of that verse is, but take heart, because I have overcome the world. And I don't know what it might be for you, but right now, a lot of you may be battling one fire or another in your life. It could be a financial fire. It could be a health-related fire. It could be a relational situation. It could be that you lost your job in the midst of all this, or your job is unstable at this time. Or maybe you've been searching for a job for quite some time, and you just can't figure out why things aren't getting better. You're doing everything you know you should do, and yet you're still struggling. The fire seems pretty hot at times. So what do you do? when you're in the middle of the fire? Well, I want to read a section of Scripture from the New Testament over in 1 Peter chapter 7 that I think will kind of establish the direction that I want to go today. I pray that it speaks to you, and then we're going to jump in to Daniel chapter 3. But let's look at this verse to start with, 1 Peter 7. These trials will show that your faith is genuine. It is being tested as fire tests and purifies gold, though your faith is far more precious than mere gold. So when your faith remains strong through many trials, it will bring you much praise and glory and honor on the day when Jesus Christ is revealed to the whole world. Peter's saying here that these trials that we go through will reveal our faith. It will show how genuine our faith is. In fact, if you're taking notes today, here's a, here's a key thought that we're going to build around in the rest of our time today, and it's this right here, that a faith, a faith that's tested is a faith that can be trusted. A taith, faith that is tested is a faith that can be trusted. In fact, today we're going to look at a faith that is extremely tested in the lives of three teenage Boys. Now, if you remember when we first started this series with Daniel chapter 1, we saw where King Nebuchadnezzar had come into Jerusalem, destroyed the city, the temple, um, took a lot of people captive. But the other thing he did was he made sure that he took the youth that were kind of the best of the best and took them back to Babylon. So he, he was trying to destroy Jerusalem's future as well. And three of the, of the young men that he took, or actually there was four of them, Daniel being one of them, and then there was Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And again, you need to remember here, 
these were probably young men, probably around 14 to 15 years of age, it's believed. And again, if you were here in the first couple of weeks when we were talking about King Nebuchadnezzar and really how evil of a king he was, we see that at one point he decides to make this giant statue of himself and tell everyone in the kingdom that you need to bow down and worship this gold statue. It's believed the statue was at least 90 feet tall. That's 30 yards straight up in the air and nine feet wide. So he says to every government leader, every advisor, every judge, every magistrate to come to the dedication of his statue. And we pick up in Daniel chapter 3 with verse 5 where he says this, when you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, lyre, harp, pipes, and other musical instruments, bow to the ground to worship King Nebuchadnezzar's gold statue. Then he says in verse 6, anyone who refuses to obey will immediately be thrown into a blazing furnace. So you get the picture. There's this gold statue. Everybody's to bow down when they come to it and worship King Nebuchadnezzar. If you don't do that, you will be thrown immediately into the blazing furnace. And if you read on in verses 12 through 15, you're going to see everyone is doing what Nebuchadnezzar wanted. They're bowing low. Everyone is bowing except for three teenage boys who continue to stand firm in their faith, even when there was a trial going on that could cause them to be thrown into this fire. Because a faith that's tested is a faith that can be trusted. Anybody had a bad day recently? Well, in this story, we've got three teenage boys that we're going to see are facing what looks to be a pretty bad day based on something they had pre-decided to do, which was they would always honor the one true God, and they would never bow down to any other pagan God. And there are some qualities that occur within this kind of faith that we're going to look at today when we're facing seasons of trial and suffering, or for today's purpose, when we're in the midst of the fire. And I really believe in my heart that, you're, that if you're listening today or you're here in person, I believe that God's going to speak to you specifically as to why would God allow us to experience some of these challenges that we're experiencing. You ever been there? where you kind of go, God, why am I facing this? What, what, what's going on? How come this is happening? So we're going to look at three qualities of faith as we navigate through the fires that we go through. So again, if you're a note taker, here's the first one you need to write down. Faith obeys God instead of following man. Faith obeys God instead of following Man, see, we got everybody's bowing here to this statue, and you got three boys that are standing. The scriptures tell us in verse 16, when we pick up with it, that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied, O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you. Now, that comes across kind of cocky, to be honest. These are 14 to 15 year olds staring down a king an imminent death, saying, you know what, king? We don't have to give you an answer because this isn't between us and you. This is between us and our God, the one true God. You see, faith obeys God instead of following man. And boy, right now in, in the world we're living in today in 2020, I want to say that again. And let it really soak in. Faith obeys God instead of following man. I mean, we're facing an election. We're facing division. We're facing hatred. Faith obeys God, not what man and everybody else is doing. That's so important here. See, they didn't have to pray about this decision. They'd already made it. They didn't have to think about it. They didn't have to fast about it. They didn't have to take... The, the dramatic circumstance of their life and post it 
in graphic detail on Facebook and then ask everybody else what they should do. They had one predetermined plan, and that was obedience to God, period. That's it. We will be obedient to God no matter what because faith obeys God instead of following man. I think it would have been so easy for them to kind of rationalize their way into compromise. I mean, think about this. Everybody's bowing down. They could have just said to the three, the three of themselves, could have said, all right, look, let's just bow down. Let's pretend that we're worshiping this 90-foot ridiculous statue. But in our hearts, we believe in the one true God. So we'll just kind of fake it. Yeah, but what about the other people that were watching? See, they, in their hearts, the three of them may have known they were faking, but what about the people that were watching, that were looking for somebody to stand at the right time for the right reasons in the right way? Or they could have taken another route. They could have said, you know, let's just worship this idol, then tomorrow we'll wake up with a lot of guilt, and then we'll just do what we've always done before. We'll ask God to forgive us. Does that sound familiar? How many times have we done that? The third option is, you know what? And it's kind of a rational thought. If I don't bow, I'm dead. And if I'm not dead, who's left to tell all these people that Jehovah is the one true God? So God, it would make sense that, you, that I need to do this. So maybe I should just compromise this one time. But they didn't do that. See, they made a predetermined decision and outcome. Remember when we talked about Daniel earlier, that he made a predetermined decision? He predecided. So when he was in the midst of things, he wouldn't waver. They do the same thing. And the predetermined decision and outcome they made was we will honor and obey God. Listen to me. We will not follow what everyone else is doing. We will not buy into the way everyone else is thinking. We will honor and obey God. Man, I hope you're hearing me today. What a message that we need to embrace as Jesus followers because so many of us right now, we're not necessarily honoring and obeying God. We're looking like everybody else. Faith obeys God instead of following man. And I promise you, if you are a follower of Christ and you're truly trying to follow after God's call for your life, Satan, your spiritual enemy, will give you ample opportunity in this world to compromise what you know to be true and what you know to be his purposes for you and others. But we will not listen. And we will not go there because our faith focuses on an audience of one. You know, I think about the hot fires that I've been through in my own life at times when some of the decisions I made were totally opposite of what most people would have done. I can remember back in 2012 after about 16 months of dealing with a health issue I was working for this corporate company, had their health insurance and retirement and all those things that went with it, the security. I had, was making a great income, but I felt in early 2012 that the Lord was calling me to resign from that position and just trust him to move forward in whatever it may have been. Felt like the Lord was calling me to do certain things. So Melinda and I gave in to that decision. We felt it was proper. It was what it was what obedience was to look like in our life, and we did it. And we caught some heat from our own family members. Thought we were crazy that I'd walked away from six figures and from security and retirement, insurance, all those things to step out on my own and not really know what I was going to do. Wound up starting a new clothing business, FHG, which stands for For His Glory, because I felt like that's what I was leaving, what I was doing 
to do was for his glory. It allowed Reup to grow and blossom at that time. So we had to have faith and be obedient in the midst of kind of a fire that was going on around us because the decision we made was counter opposite of what other good meaning people thought we should do. As I said, some thought we were crazy. But see, faith in the fire, it obeys God. It doesn't listen to the comments of the consensus or the majority. We obey God and him alone. The second thing, if you want to write this down, is faith obeys in spite of what it sees. Faith obeys in spite of what it sees. Verse 17 here in Daniel chapter 3 says, If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God whom we serve is able to save us. He will rescue us from your power, your majesty. See, no matter what I see, I believe that not only is God my all-powerful, but did you see the second part here? I believe he's willing to save me. And see, there's a big difference between God just being able to do something in my life and God wanting to do something in my life. And no matter what the circumstances look like, no matter what you see, maybe some of you, what you see right now is you've left the doctor's office in the last few months with a diagnosis that's kind of scary. And it's rocked your world. So what do we do in those kind of situations? Well, again, I think we've got some options here, three options. Number one is we could trust God. So our faith has to rise in those situations when we trust God. And you believe that with everything in you that my God is not only able to heal me, but I believe my God is willing to heal me. Now, what he actually does, well, that's up to him. But he has called us to pray and believe our prayers of faith. Maybe for some of you, you're looking at a dangerously low checking account right now. So what do you do? Well, first off, you sell that motorcycle. Secondly, you go out and get a job, any job. And then thirdly, you believe with everything in you that my God is willing and able to be my provider. Because what's his name? Well, one of his names is Jehovah Jireh, which means he is my provider. Maybe you have a relationship that's absolutely falling apart around you. So what do you do? What does our faith do in the midst of that? Our faith has to grow and say, I believe that God is willing and able to restore this relationship. See, I know there's a lot of doubt in so many of you watching, so many of you here this morning. And I often think we are lured into the thought that the things that we allow ourselves to think, think and the things that we allow ourselves to pray and the things that we allow the circumstances around us to define, we seem to confine God to the things that we see. Remember last week where we discovered with Daniel that God is working even when we don't understand and see it? It's the same here. God is not confined to the things that we see. See, faith obeys no matter what or in spite of what it sees. Because he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And he's able to do exceedingly and abundantly more than you would ever dare ask him. Again, last week, what did we say? He cares about you more than you care about you. So why would we ever doubt? Our faith says that God is with us, and our faith believes no matter what we see. But make no mistake, the things that God puts in your heart to believe for, God will probably take a path very unlike what you think he's going to take. Let me say that again. The things that God puts in your heart to believe for, God will probably take a path very unlike what you think 
he's going to take. But that's what makes him God and us not. And that really leads us to the hardest question in all of this, and it's this question right here. What if God doesn't do what you are believing him to do? What if you're believing God to heal someone and they die? What if you're believing God to bring your kids back in, this, your, a child back into faith with Christ, but they seem to be getting sucked further into an addiction and rebellion against God? What do you do then? Because that's where some of you are living right now. So I want you to write this last thought down, and it's this. Faithful obedience is our responsibility. The outcome is God's. Faithful obedience is our response. It's the only thing we can control. The outcome is God's. What if you're believing, as I said, God to bring your kid back from that addiction or heal this person? Living out what God has called us to do, the life he has purposed for you to live, that's your job, and that's where your job ends. What God does after that is where his job begins. Our job is to be obedient, to be faithful, and how he plays it out is entirely up to him. Daniel 3.18 says this. But even if he doesn't, we want to make it clear to you your majesty, that we will never serve your gods or worship the gold statue you have set up. Now, remember, they're staring down this king, and they're telling him what, we, what they believe God will do. But even if he doesn't, we want to make it clear. I mean, listen to the authority in their speak, that they will never serve or bow down to any other gods. See, we will do what it's, what's right before God. That's our responsibility. And we will trust God with the outcome. And I know that's hard. But that's the only thing we can do. In sales, we say it this way. You can't control the results, but you can control the activity. It's the same thing here. Our job is just to be faithful and obedient and trust him with the outcome, whatever that outcome may be. And I know it's super easy for us to look at this story and say, well, duh, of course they said this. But see, we know the outcome. That's why we say that. We know they're going to be rescued because we're several thousand years removed from this happening. We've got three young boys that are facing a really hot oven about to become pretty crispy critters. They don't know what God's going to do, but their faith is unwavering. You don't say that without your faith being unwavering. They don't know what God's going to do, but because they know intimately the goodness, the power, and the heart of their God, they're just going to trust Him, and they're not going to waver in their stance, and they're going to stand firm in the fire. And so in response to this rebellion, what does the king do? Well, for the first time ever, King Nebuchadnezzar orders that the furnace be stoked seven times hotter than normal. He orders that the strong soldiers bind their hands, the, the three young men bind their hands with ropes, and then throw them in to the furnace. They're going to be killed. And the furnace was so hot that the Bible actually records that these soldiers that were throwing the boys into the furnace, that they died instantly. They didn't go in it, but being that close to it, they died instantly. That's how hot this furnace was. And so seemingly, these three young teenagers get thrown to their death. But then verse 24. But suddenly, Nebuchadnezzar jumped up in amazement and exclaimed to his advisors, didn't we tie up three men 
and throw them into the furnace? Yes, your majesty, we certainly did, they replied. Verse 25, look, Nebuchadnezzar shouted, I see four men unbound, walking around in the fire unharmed. And the fourth looks like a god. Some versions say looks like the son of God. Now, remember, this isn't the New Testament. This isn't the book of Acts. This isn't Ephesians. This isn't Romans. This is the book of Daniel in the Old Testament. So what do we got here? We got the same thing we saw last week in Daniel chapter 10. We got a pre-incarnate version or reality, pre-incarnate reality of Jesus himself. He's in the fire with them. And listen to me. God will show his power in all kinds of different ways through the course of your life. But you will know his presence, the tangible reality of the presence of Christ best when you are in the fire. The number of people I have encountered, much like myself at different times, that talked about when they were in the heat of something, in the midst of, of a, just an amazing trial, they experienced Jesus like never before. And some of you need to hear that today. That the tangible reality of the presence of Jesus is best and most present sometimes when you're in the midst of the fire. See, Nebuchadnezzar re re realizes we threw three boys in. Now we see four men loose. They're not bound. And the scripture says that they were unharmed and they were unburned. Their robes weren't even burned or charred. But there was something actually, I believe, in looking at this text that actually did burn. And I need some of you to hear this. The Bible says that they were loose, which means they, were, they became unbound. The ropes burned. What was, what was keeping them bound was consumed. And again, they threw three in, and they were bound. But when they looked in, there were four that were unbound. And the fire had burned that which had bound them. And why is that relevant? Why am I wanting to point that out? Because some of you are facing a fire right now, some big, some small, and you're begging God to deliver you from whatever this suffering is. You're begging God to end this season of challenge. You're begging God to end this season of hurt, to end this season of trials and suffering. But could I just propose that perhaps, even as we just saw in this story, that the very thing you want God to remove from you is the very mechanism God wants to use to set you free? Maybe it's a number of years of addiction, and you're facing the most excruciating trial of your life, hurting the people that love you the most. And the very thing that you've begged God to remove from you is the very thing God is going to use to liberate you. Don't minimize what the presence of God in the circumstance of your heart, your hurt, will accomplish. God will use all things, remember? All things to work together for his good. And then we conclude in verse 28. We see this. Then Nebuchadnezzar said, praise to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He sent his angel to rescue his servants who trusted in him. They defied the king's command and were willing to die rather than serve or worship any god except their own god. See, when God shows up in your heart, your hurt, the world will look on and God will be glorified. They will see you, but they will glorify God. They will recognize there's something different about you. You have something working in your life for you on your behalf that maybe they don't have. And they praise be to God, maybe of Jason, who was set free from addiction and never went back. Praise be God to the God of Samantha, who stood by her husband when she didn't have to. And God has now made their marriage brand new. 
Praise be to God, the God of Jonathan, who began to honor God with their finances that were such a wreck. See, when you stand in the midst of the battle, people that are looking on, they will see you, but they will honor God. What did, what did he say here? Praise to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who sent his angels to rescue his servants who trusted in him. You see, they trusted in him, and they defied the king's commands and were willing to give up their very lives rather than serve or worship any god except their god. You see, when your faith is tested, that is a faith that can be trusted. When your faith is tested in the midst of the fire, and God steps in with you, that is a faith that can be trusted, and that is a faith that others just might want. So let's be those people in the midst of the fire. Let's pray. Father, as I've said throughout this series, I've felt very confident that each message each week was going to speak specifically to somebody, to quite a few somebodies maybe, whether they were watching on the other side of the screen or they're here in person, or maybe they're going to they come across this video sometime later this week and happen to watch it, or maybe somebody here or somebody watching decided to share this video with somebody online that thought it might help them. And I would encourage people to do that just as you want them to. If you don't know of somebody that's going through something that could benefit from what we heard you say this morning, not Tim Brown, what we heard you say, I was just the messenger. So, Father, I know there's somebody out there that's, that needed this. It's going to embrace this, and you're going to work in their life because of it. So we just trust you to do that. And Father, in the midst of the fires and the trials and the suffering that each of us face on an ongoing basis, and in the world we're living in today, we just need to see Jesus followers step up while the fire is pretty hot and stand firm in their faith and not compromise. And as we've seen through this story today, that when we do that, others will notice. They will recognize something different, and what they will recognize is, is you. And they might just want that because they've tried everything else. So, Father, if there's somebody listening today, watching here in person, that needs for the very first time to give their life to you. So when they're in the midst of these fires, you'll step in there with them. If they felt alone throughout their life and have never had that, that can change today. And tomorrow, starting tomorrow, whenever they step into a fire, you will be there with them. So, Father, if there's somebody listening today or here this morning that needs to give their life to you for the very first time, I just pray right now that that fear will, will be released and they will do that. And they'll hit in the comment, they'll type, I want to talk to somebody about this. I've decided I want to make Jesus the Lord of my life so we can follow up with them. Or if they want to just pray this simple prayer real quick with me right now. Father, I know Jesus was real. I know he died, uh, lived a perfect, sinless life, and he died on a cross for me so I could be forgiven. And he came back to life three days later and defeated death. And I want to make him my Savior. I want to make him my life. I want to accept his mercy, his grace, and his forgiveness. And I want to be committed to Jesus for the rest of my life. If you would just say that right there, in any way you want to say it, God will accept you, and you will be saved. And boy, what a, what a great opportunity you will have to move forward with the God that will step into the fire with you in the midst of your suffering. So, Father, we just ask that you be who only you can be and do what only you can do. And we ask all this in the name of Jesus, our best friend and our Savior. Amen. If you're somebody who wants to talk this morning or you've made some decisions, 
All you got to do is type in the comment box, send us a personal message, whatever you want to do. We would be honored to be able to have that conversation with you, pray with you, talk about some things so you could have this God in the midst of your fires who will step in there with you. So have a great week, guys. We'll see you next week here at Church at the Corner Online. Hope you'll enjoy Jesus this week. Thanks a lot.